It is just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing an orthodontist named Scott Frey, DDS, MSD, all the way from Allentown, Pennsylvania. We were talking, uh, he's got to be a Billy Joel fan because that was one of my favorite Billy Joel songs of all time. Are you a Billy Joel fan? I am, absolutely. And, uh, what was that song about? It was kind of a blues song. It was about hard times, steel you know, mills, it's, closing it's down. That, it's sad that it's like, you know, kind of attached itself to, uh, you know, the town name, but it's it's depressing. It's about, you know, all the steel mills are closing down and, you know, people are just stuck there living in Allentown. But it's it's more actually about Bethlehem when I was looking it up the other day because someone else had brought it up as well. Um, you know, he just liked the way Allentown sounded uh, compared to. Well, Wolf I thought Al- if he was going to write a sad song, it was losing uh, Christy Brinkley as his wife. How do you how do you yeah. lose Christy Brinkley? I mean, he should have just uh, that that should have been the saddest song in the world. I yeah, can still remember uh, when he was dating that supermodel. So Scott Frey is a graduate of the University of Pacific Arthur A. Dagoni School of Dentistry, which is in San Francisco, correct? Yes. And- and, and it, er- uh, it's I, I before we get too far, it's, it's pronounced Fry. I know it's a weird spelling. Okay, for like F R Y. Yeah. Well, actually, I am a uh, huge connoisseur of French fries, so I will not, <laughs> not forget that. And uh, and and earned his postdoctoral master's degree and certificate in orthodontics from the University of Colorado. Doctor Fry is a board certified in orthodontics, is a top one percent provider of Invisalign, and has earned fellowships from the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry and the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics for his achievements in private practice, maintained a private practice exclusive to cosmetic and therapeutic injectables during his orthodontic residency, and is an international expert and lecturer on aesthetic orthodontics, accelerated orthodontics, and injectable pharmacologies. Dr. Frey has pioneered the development of the soft tissue orthodontic curriculum for Henry Schein Orthodontics, is a published scientific author, and is a reviewer for the Journal of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, uh, Scott, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be on the show. I had several orthodontists. You know Anne Marie Gorsica? Yeah. Yeah, she was telling me, you got to get Scott on your show. He, he is he is the best in this field, the best in this class. So so it sounds like um, you're taking well, orthodontics. You oh, it's an honor. It sounds like you're taking orthodontics. You're kind of mixing orthodontics with uh, plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery. or I mean, that's you know, something I think of a plastic surgeon doing. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, David uh, David Sarver is a great uh, friend and mentor of mine. And you know, early on in um, you know my dental career, my orthodontic career, you know, a lot of what he and uh, Bill Prophet and you know people in that uh, you know similar mindset have uh, contributed. You know, it had a big impact on me. And what most people, when people think of orthodontics, especially the layperson, um, you know, what they don't really understand is the very first professional that's ever going to make a decision about how someone's facial structure is going to mature in the sense of the airway, in the sense of you know their facial appearance, that's not the plastic surgeon, it's not the dermatologist, it's not the ENT, it's the orthodontist. And that's a pretty profound responsibility. And when we look at you know kind of rounding that out, you know, we can do a lot of wonderful things with growth. We can modify it. We can really enhance the facial appearance in so many different ways with our appliances. But I found that at the end of treatment, especially in our adult patients um, who uh, you know didn't necessarily elect to go through with uh, some adjunctive uh, surgical procedures or thignathic surgery, that there were certain things that were lacking in the finish that I simply just did not want to accept. Um, and you know, with uh, the advent of a lot of these injectable uh, products. It's really uh, provided a nice gap between some of the surgeries that we regularly prescribe for patients and the traditional kind of non-surgical orthodontic treatment. And we were able to get these really, really wonderful outcomes for patients, uh, make things more accessible uh, because it's not that $20,000 jaw surgery. Um, you know, it's a much more kind of, uh, you know, accessible procedure in a lot of ways. You know, that, uh, that orthodontic surgery, Lafort one, two or three, all that stuff, uh, back in the day when I got out of school in 87, that was a, uh, crazy surgery. And I remember going into hospitals in 87 and visiting the patient and you just look at him like, did I, I felt, I remember one time I felt so bad that I recommended yeah. him to an orthodontist to talk about that. And he went through it that I'm looking at this guy, like, is he even going to live? And now, three decades later, that surgery is a lot more minimally invasive than it was yep. in the 80s, wasn't it? 
Yeah, everything gets better and better year after year. Um, you know, there's, you know, we still do a lot of, uh, you know, orthognathic surgery still uh, for patients that require it. Um, but we've got so many tools now, everything from, you know, different tools with photobiomodulation, with accelerated orthodontic modalities. We've got, you know, uh, you know, less invasive surgical procedures, more stable surgical procedures than we've ever had before. And then also tools that are, um, you know, not surgical, but still achieve a surgical level of result, which, you know, with uh, mini screw implants and, you know, some of the injectables that we have. So. A lot and of great. You, and, and were you thinking about this more? All these injectables because you were from uh, Colorado, the first state to legalize uh, marijuana for uh, recreational <laughs> use. Did you just have all these injectables on your mind? And were, no, you know, it was um, it was more so my wife's idea. She, <laughs> <laughs> she, you know, she, um, you know, twisted my arm. I was really a big skeptic, honestly, um, before I had firsthand experience with it, but. You know, it seemed that, you know, there were there were people in orthodontics who had spoken about it with regard to gummy smile. And that was like the one bit of, you know, information that I had, you know, giving it an orthodontic perspective. And, you know, my wife was just really adamant, you know, you should go and, you know, uh, take take a course, get trained, you know, get some more knowledge. And I sat in there and, you know, I can remember kind of hearing about, you know, what Botox was, what, you know, various classes of neuromodulators were. And, you know, uh, with these soft tissue injectables, um, what they did and with all, without all that taboo associated with it, and it just kind of clicked for me because it's given all of the things that we get to do orthodontically, this seemed just like a natural fit and a natural progression, um, you know, of what we uh, are already trying to do in so many ways for the growing patient. Well, I, I think you're seeing the, the true big picture because... I remember when I was in dental school, okay, so my mom and dad, I'm from Wichita. I was born in the big, you know, the big city. My, my mom and dad yeah. were from Parsons, Kansas, and mm -hmm. all their uh, grandparents. I mean, th these are small town Kansas. I had so many cousins that, you know, um, didn't have any teeth and ate peanuts mm -hmm. and, and, all, and all this stuff. So when everybody would talk about ortho is about form and function and including the occlusion, I, I always sat there and thought, they're all doing it for looks. They're all doing it for cosmetic. You take your patient with the worst bite in the world and they might be 350 pounds. I've got cousins yeah. that don't have any teeth and are 100 pounds overweight. So, so ortho is all about just looking better, look at, you know, getting rid of a gummy smile, getting straight teeth, whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. Is that, do you, I mean, do you agree or disagree? You know, I, I definitely subscribe, you know, no one's falling over from a bad bite and certainly the insurance companies <laughs> feel the same way. Um, you know, there's, there's wonderful benefits to uh, improved function that, you know, we can realize, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the aesthetics are the big driver because we can have, you know, good function and very, very poor aesthetics. But to get the best of both worlds to have really excellent function and really excellent aesthetics, um, you know, the patient's really not going to see, you know, uh, what, how things are functioning. They only see, you know, the aesthetic element of that. And that's the big driving factor, um, you know, for, I, for, I, I think I should have said more economically clear that, yeah. uh, form and function is great, but when people yeah. open up their purse and their credit card, they're paying for aesthetics. So when, well, when the and cash that's... hits your counter, it's for good looks, not form. Yeah, and function. That's, that's the thing I, I think. One of the things that makes orthodontics unique, um, and you know, there's a lot of talk about you know the uh, the consolidation of uh, the dental field, and you know, in many ways, I agree, um, you know, with that sentiment. Um, you know, and the big driving factor is the insurance companies behind that. But when you look at an elective aesthetic treatment, you look at what's happened in the medical field, and you look at what has consolidated down into the larger networks. You know, it is different things. It's not the elective care that's really inside these large networks now and in these corporate, uh, you know, kind of entities. Um, you know, some of the elective stuff uh, does very well outside of that model. And it's, you know, it's a bit unique. And I think orthodontics kind of falls in this weird little pocket of dentistry. Um, you know, that's, uh, it's a little bit different sometimes. Well, you know, when I was your age, um, orthodontic centers of America, was rolling up all the orthodontic offices, made it to the New York Stock Exchange, had a billion dollar valuation, and they completely imploded, along with a dozen other chains on the NASDAQ. Then they all yep. went away for a decade and they're back. Yep. And I, I just think that, uh, um, um, the same thing with like Universal 
healthcare system on a single payer. I mean, yeah. Japan, Paris, and London are down to paying $100 for a molar root canal. And I lectured in those cities. And I mean, so when I got out of school, 20,000 out of 20,000 British dentists played that game. Now 5,000 yeah. have walked away from it. I mean, how, I mean, when molar endo gets down to $100 and they're walking in with their $800 iPhone wanting you to go to eight years of college and do a, a $100, you know, so... So I, I think that'll ebb and flow, but at the end of the day, all all dentistry is hands-on surgery, and people, it's never going to be a race to the bottom. So, so um, do you really think general dentists and orthodontists should all be injecting botulism and fur, filmers yeah. and all all this stuff? I mean, well, I mean, is this so yeah. niche that maybe like you're well, you're not even in a rich town. I mean, not to make fun of Allentown, but it's not yeah, like no, you're in Biscayne or Manhattan. There's nothing really, you know, rich or poor about, um, you know, integrating these procedures into treatment. Um, it's really about the goals. And if we can remove muscular obstacles by, by utilizing, you know, neuromodulators like Botox, um, if we can augment, you know, gingival soft tissues, facial soft tissues to provide a more aesthetic outcome uh, that is a lasting outcome, um, you know, then I think that people will find the value in it and find, uh, you know, the money for it. And, you know, certainly I don't think that every, you know, bit of technology is for every orthodontist or every dentist out there. But, you know, really, you know, and speaking just from my own perspective, you know, the orthodontists who realize what their profound role is for patient care uh, and all the responsibilities that they have beyond just arbitrarily lining up teeth – you know, are going to understand the value of having other tools in their in their tool chest to to be able to address problems and provide more comprehensive care. And I think, you know, from the standpoint of of all of dentistry, if we don't have knowledge of these tools, how are we ever going to be able to recommend them? Even if we're not doing them ourselves, certainly we can all benefit from knowledge about how these can improve uh, the outcome for patients. So how do my homies listening to you right now, how do, how do they learn all this injectable? How do they learn this? Well, you know, I think I know, you, I know you got a website coming soon, the, the sure. orthocosmos.com. When is, when is the orthocosmos going to um, be? I'm, you know, that should be getting launched in uh, another week or two. Um, there's a lot of really great contributors that uh, I'm trying to, to gather together. I think what's ended up happening um, in a lot of, uh, you know, ways – you know, we've really done a wonderful job crafting these, you know, almost intellectual ghettos for ourselves. We have where we stifle, you know, free thought, free discussion. We don't allow people outside to come in and question uh, and, uh, you know, discuss various topics. And I think that there's a big place for a forum like that um, and to kind of invite, uh, you know, some high level discussions among orthodontists and dentists alike. Um, you know, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the knowledge progresses forward. Because, you know, if we look at, you know, the profession as a whole, if we're not moving forward, we're really moving backwards. And I think that, you know, half of the stuff that I see published anymore, you know, are based on, you know, pieces of technology or equipment that's, you know, several decades old as, at this point and really not offering anything unique in terms of its therapeutic benefit. And to really just mulch over the exact same topics over and over is not benefiting anyone. Um, you know, as, and, and to your question as to where people can learn this, I think there's very wonderful, um, you know, courses that are geared for uh, the general uh, general dentists out there uh, through the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics, and they do a great job. The courses that I do uh, in partnership with Henry Schein, um, the soft tissue orthodontics uh, curriculum, uh, is geared specifically to uh, orthodontists and to some degree oral surgeons. Um, and you know the you know basically the we're actually doing um, you know kind of uh, our first. First course, um, you know, this year with the new format that we've uh, we've built, um, where we have, you know, day one is kind of focused on establishing this wonderful platform and foundation uh, for great aesthetics, a great airway, uh, and then the second day it focuses on the soft tissue finishing aspects, using the injectables uh, to go ahead and really polish off the results well, uh, and it's uh, specifically geared towards orthodontists, and it's uh, you know it's not something that we've done before you know, in orthodontics. And after going through the process, I can see why, because of the, the legal issues with, uh, you know, some of these companies who are distributors and how they can approach uh, and discuss various, uh, you know, 
uh, pharmacologics like, you know, Botox, fillers and, and such. But, you know, it's been a lot of work, a lot of effort, but we've gotten it to, um, you know, uh, to this point. We've got a really fantastic two-day course uh, for orthodontists. So you, okay, so you mentioned the American Academy of Facial mm -hmm. Aesthetics. Is that you? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I was originally, you know, I started out, um, you know, as a faculty member with them and kind of progressed into, you know, kind of a dual role, um, you know, where, um, you know, I still, uh, will, uh, help out, uh, locally with some courses and, um, you know, in various areas with the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. Um, the, it's a very different course format that they have and they're more broad in their approach and they've got a really great curriculum. They've got, um, you know, things for nurses, they've got things for, uh, you know, MDs and they've got things for DMDs and EDSs. So, you know, they've got a very, you know, broad offering of different courses. Um, and, you know, I will, uh, you know, uh, you know, help out with training at some of those courses. Uh, but I also do the orthodontic specific uh, curriculum where we talk about orthodontic treatment uh, and injectables and how that fits into, um, you know, good orthodontic care uh, with Henry Schein. So um, I noticed Henry Schein really is a major orthodontic player. I mean, they seem to be really, <laughs> really uh, big into orthodontic continuing education. What do you call it? Henry Schein? Um, orthodontic HSO? Yeah. Symposiums. Mm -hmm. So now are you yeah. thinking this is something that orthodontists should be doing or general dentists too? You know, I really think it's, it's something for everybody. Um, I think that there's certain classes of treatment uh, that are very, very well suited for uh, primary care, care dentists to administer. And then there's certain treatments that are fitting uh, well with uh, orthodontic care a little bit more specifically. So for instance, you know, anytime, uh, you know, I'm prescribing these treatments, there is, uh, an orthodontic treatment plan. There's an orthodontic context, uh, that's present. So we're looking at the broad goals, uh, of the facial aesthetics. We're looking at how we're going to be positioning the teeth and jaws, uh, into the right spots, and then how we can finish the soft tissues with the injectables. Um, so, you know, there's certain things when it comes to treating, uh, you know, deep bite and brachyfacial patients. There's certain things when it comes to treating gummy smile as part of a comprehensive orthodontic plan. Um, you know, temporomandibular disorders when it involves uh, a lot of repositioning of the teeth. Um, and, you know, really alternatives to orthognathic treatment because the orthodontist is quarterbacking these decisions about the orthognathic surgery and to be able to uh, offer patients a more intermediate option uh, as opposed to the full-on surgery that can oftentimes provide as good of an aesthetic result as the surgery itself. Uh, I think those types of treatments are very, very well suited for the orthodontic practice. You know, and there's other treatments uh, that are going to be, you know, excellent fits uh, for primary care dentists to, to administer. So um, I, what, there's about what, uh, about what, 11,000 orthodontists in the United States? I, you know, I honestly, it seems, it seems like there's way more than that some days, but on, um, you know, I would say that that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Well, I, I own dental town and ortho town. I think our mailing list, uh, dental town is 125,000 general dentists. I think ortho town is, uh, 11,000. Um, wow. what, what percent of the, of the whole U S market, what, what percent of the average orthodontist is adult versus child? And at what age would, um, these, uh, Botox and injectables. Uh, I mean, is that you know what? When does that come? Yeah, in? No, I, that's I mean, a, I mean a, did you, you have to be eighteen years old to get that, or twenty-one? Well, or? You know, and here's the thing: they're doing it on uh, cleft lip and palate babies for primary lip closure uh, during the surgery to reduce the appearance and the size of the scar, and it's very, very effective. They've done some great longitudinal studies there. Um, so it's not you know, there's no one too young, there's no one too old. Uh, it just matters whether there's a, an appropriate indication for the product. So I've there's been patients who are, you know, early teens who have horrible debilitating migraines and have had no relief uh, through various avenues of care that they've sought uh, in medicine. And I've utilized Botox to treat their migraine and resolve their migraine and get them back in school, get them back, you know, functioning in society. And, you know, it's funny because both, most people think of Botox as a wrinkle drug, but it's always been for, you know, since its inception, a therapeutic medicine. And it's the only medicine that's FDA approved for the treatment of chronic migraines. And it is so, so effective for this. And, you know, with the younger patients, 
Uh, if there is, you know, uh, an oral facial pain condition, uh, certainly it's part of the thought process there, even though they are a younger patient. I'm not going to recommend, uh, you know, treating wrinkles on a 12-year-old, uh, certainly not. Um, but, uh, you know, we have some of that over in New Jersey sometimes. But uh, the, um, you know, the, the main indications are, you know, in a younger patient are for, you know, things like, uh, you know, the cleft lip and palate uh, closure. Uh, oral facial pain conditions. Uh, we can, in somebody who has a very short lip, as we're waiting for that to mature, to reduce the activity of smiling muscles, uh, or if they have an asymmetric smile, we're able to treat that effectively with Botox. Um, but those are conditions that for a younger patient population where there's uh, a dystonia of the muscles, you know, some hyperactive muscles, uh, muscular asymmetry, um, you know, and oral facial pain that we're actually treating um, in the young patient. But as far as, you know, most of these treatments are going to fall, uh, you know, in the spectrum of adult patient care. Um, and certainly there's a growing segment of adult patients that are out there, uh, that are being treated in orthodontic practice. Uh, it's growing a heck of a lot more, uh, than the adolescent, uh, patient pool. That's almost like a zero sum game where people are just chopping up the same size pie, um, you know, amongst themselves in their area. So how does uh, Botox neuromodulators and uh, reducing migraines, how, how does that tie into the theory of these migraines uh, and the fact that it's pretty much, what, 80% women having all these migraines? Yeah, so about 20% of uh, people, you know, between the ages of, I believe it's 30 and 50 years of age, uh, have, um, you know, symptoms of uh, migraines when they've done uh, these large population surveys. What so percent? What's that? What percent? 20% of, uh, you know, all mothers walking through an orthodontic practice. From age 30 to 50? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, um, you know, one out of five uh, of those moms uh, are somebody, are people that can benefit um, from, from tools like this. Um, but, you know, it is, uh, it's a very effective tool. They used to do uh, a surgical procedure, um, you know, and that's essentially what we're approximating with the, the Brotox. We're doing some broad decompression of the nerves. Well, why, uh, why is it mom and not dad? You know, I think there's hormonal factors uh, involved um, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the actual migraine presentation. And, you know, perhaps, you know, men, you know, we have those like billboards, uh, you know, basically like don't let stubbornness like keep you from going to the doctor. And, you know, honestly, you know, we, it's just like the male, uh, you know, problem that we have, we're really stubborn. We, just, you know, perhaps we're reporting on these surveys, you know, at a lower rate, you know, just because, uh, you know, we're really stubborn kind of. Uh, so so it, you it, think it, women it, just, <laughs> you, 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 what percent of it's hormonal estrogen versus testosterone versus women uh, are, will go access a healthcare provider. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's childbearing years. That's where they see the big spike. So, you know, if we're looking at, you know, hormonal factors, certainly I think that plays a big role in it. Uh, it's really hard to say exactly why that there's such a disproportionate gender bias. Um, you know, and I don't want to, uh, you know, with my white male privilege here, I don't want to go ahead and, uh, you know, speculate. Um, but well, you know, all it, I can say is I know it's not from the women's husband. I know, yeah, I know that. Yeah, it could be that. It could no, be that. Two men have I, to come on. We oh got to stick God. together on this. We got to stick together. It cannot yeah. be from the husband. <laughs> it's definitely not us, then. Yeah, I, yeah. So, um, I, I, in my, um, I graduated eighty-seven to twenty sixteen. Been practicing twenty-nine years. Mm -hmm. In my walnut brain. Uh, the biggest thing to hit orthodontics in my three decades was Invisalign. I was so impressed. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about ortho, fix versus uh, uh, clear, or, just mm -hmm. in the brand name. I mean, I can't think of a single other dental brand name that dentists talk about and use that everybody on earth knows the name of. I mean, probably the last brand that big on the planet was Colgate and Crest. I mean, I mean no matter what country you go to, the waitress yeah. at, finds out you're a dentist and ask about Invisalign. I'm talking about Malaysia, Indonesia, yeah. Soweto, South Africa, Rio. I mean, the whole world, they, they've just done an amazing marketing job. Oh, yeah. And it's honestly, um, you know, they've really, there was this untapped need. And I think there's a lot of products that are out there that have come up in probably the last 15 years where, 
the public has been asking for so many decades for an alternative to traditional treatment. And one of the big drivers of growth is always technology. And I think, you know, they're, you know, as opposed to being a clear aligner company, one of the reasons why they've been so successful is they're more a technology company than anything. You know, if you look at what they've driven in terms of digital patient treatment, you know, with the ClinCheck, with, you know, the iTero, <clears throat> you know, they've really been driving things forward uh, in, uh, you know, in orthodontics. And it's it's really impressive what they've uh, what they've been able to achieve, and I love the product. You know, I am one of their clinical faculty, full disclosure, um, as well, and a, a big user of the product. So I'm I'm very happy uh, with it. Some people were uh, um, shocked when th there was a company that did ortho retainers uh, straight to your home, so they could send you an impression okay. kit. You buy it into. But, but I don't know why everyone's so surprised that this. What, what was the name of that company? Smile Direct Club. Yeah, so so yeah. talk about I talk. I'm a ball guy, so I was only looking at that shaver collect that sh well, shaver direct your own. It was called you know, what? Smile Direct Club. Smile Direct Club, and you know they. I think the people who've run one eight hundred contacts and uh, some of these other similar you know direct to home companies are uh, in charge of managing uh, Smile Direct Club. Um, the I think the jury's still out on you know, uh, what the, you know, how effective this is going to be in terms of delivering it straight to home and what the blowback is going to be. Cause you know, they're only, you know, February, 2015 is when they had their first release. Then they rebranded, you know, they probably with their marketing have more patients in active treatment than they have finished at this stage. So we'll see. Um, but here's the thing, you know, I don't know why everyone acts so surprised that this product exists. It's a natural progression. It's a natural evolution. And, you know, for someone like Align who is making clear aligners to, you know, have uh, clear correct, uh, you know, basically producing what they were the exclusive producer for a while of, um, you know, uh, Smile Direct Club's aligners to, you know, look at this and look at a serious threat to their business because, you know what? Um, you know what the product essentially is. It's uh, you know it's it's people who are looking for convenience and price over quality, and that's what they value most. I don't know that there's a whole lot of overlap, um, you know, with the traditional orthodontic population, with the ones that are going to be you know going to uh, Smile Direct Club. Um, but you know that's nonetheless you know their job is to produce for the shareholders more aligners. You know, if you're looking at their actual obligations, you know, with the SEC and everything else, you know, they're they're liable to get sued if they don't even like uh, invest or purchase this company. So I'm not seeing why there was like this huge surprise. And it's a little bit arrogant, um, you know, on the part. And I know this is an unpopular opinion uh, out there. It's a little bit arrogant for us to, uh, you know, presume that we have ownership over, you know, who can deliver and dispense, you know, clear aligners and things like that, you know, it's, it's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with. And if I think for the orthodontists who are really concerned with, you know, first of all, not only Smile Direct Club producing aligners, but general dentists doing orthodontic treatment, which is a kind of a ludicrous assumption, um, you know, really they need to take a look in the mirror and look at what they can be doing to address their patients a lot better and grow their own practice. Because, you know, the mindset of, you know, oh, we need to shut Smile Direct Club down. We need to shut, you know, uh, the all Adonis down or something ridiculous like that. You know, what are we going to go into people's homes and start kicking in their doors for uh, extracting baby teeth and practicing unlicensed dentistry? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the terminus of that that mindset. And we need to be objective, dispassionate and look at what we can do to continue to evolve our specialty and our profession together uh, to be able to serve high-level patient needs. And we're inevitably going to have products like this popping up along the way. Uh, and, you know, we need to anticipate it so we don't react in this, you know, this knee-jerk emotional, uh, you know, tantrum that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing occurring out there. And, you know, I expect, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get like some, you know, hateful Facebook or like email messages about that. And I don't care because, it, you know, the facts are the facts. Invisalign has an obligation to their shareholders. And, you know, if you want to hedge your bets, go buy some Align stock and do that, you know. So I, I don't really don't know what else to say, you know, uh, about that, but other than it's inevitable. And I, you know, we should have seen it coming 
um, you know, and instead of being very upset about that, it did happen. So wh where is the market at now in your practice? What percent of your practice is fixed bracket and wires versus uh, clear liners? Well, I would say overall we're probably at, you know, maybe 40%, um, 35, 40% in this line. Um, you know, they're... And is that mostly adult? Kids are fixed? You know, I, or... I, think, I think we're skewed adult on that because, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the younger patients, there's, um, you know, impacted canines and other things that the aligners simply can't get to. Um, to bring into the mouth. Um, there's, you know, and obviously, you know, I've done impacted canine cases with Invisalign, but it's, you know, it's how many times, how many things you're going to bond onto the teeth before it's just fixed appliances anyway. But, um, you know, there's, you know, I would say, you know, mostly adult patients, um, you know, for us, but, you know, I present it, you know, as the same as braces because ultimately I don't think the teeth are that smart that they know the difference between the clear plastic and the braces. If the ClinCheck is properly set up and if the patient's wearing it the requisite amount of time, um, you know, you're not, you're going to get the exact same outcome, uh, with either appliance. Um, so, you know, it's really up to them and what fits their lifestyle. And, you know, for the younger patients, you know, they like the colors, they like the brackets and, you know, they do, um, you know, frequently choose braces. Um, you know, the adults certainly want to avoid braces if at all possible, but some of them are honest and tell me, you know, I'm simply not going to wear the aligners. Um, you know, I'm going to drink my coffee. I would be one of those people, um, you know, and they're, they're going to go with, you know, clear braces or regular braces. Um, but, uh, you know, and I think, you know, when you ask, normal uh, orthodontists out there. And I hear this question a lot. It's like, well, you know, those, I don't see those patients, you know, they don't come in, you know, not everybody wants Invisalign. Well, you know, the, the, the larger accounts for Invisalign in a particular area are seeing a, a completely different spectrum of patients uh, from someone who's, you know, only doing a handful of Invisalign cases because, um, you know, people come to me, they know an Invisalign faculty member, uh, they know the number of cases that we're doing and how experienced they are and they've seen the results they're coming in asking for it up front at a far greater rate than I would expect, you know, someone else who's really not doing, um, you know, or, or as experienced with the product. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, adult heavy product. Um, you know, it's, it's excellent product for teens as well. Um, and that's probably the fastest growing segment right now in our practice because the adults have just always been getting it. So you have your fellowship in the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry. Yeah. I always think of minimally invasive dentistry having to do with restorative dentistry, you know, smaller preps, less enamel removal. Um, how does minimally invasive really apply to orthodontics? Well, you know, it's a lot of my background um, in getting, uh, you know, presenting and giving my fellowship, um, you know, with, uh, you know, the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry. Um you know, it's really shaped my, um, you know, understanding of, uh, you know, white spot lesion prevention in the oral biome and focusing on, you know, tools like that. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, going to UOP, you know, we had, um, you know, carry free products, um, you know, uh, they're, you know, really great line of products and they've continued to kind of rebrand and do different things where they were focused on, you know, carries risk assessment targeting uh, the bacteria and the quality of the bacteria and helping to shift that uh, towards, um, you know, better bacteria. The interesting thing is, and, you know, I know that there's not, there's misunderstanding on this in the orthodontic community, about 42 to 50 percent of all fixed bracketed patients will get at least one white spot lesion during the course of treatment of varying degrees. What was the percent? 42 to 50 percent. So you yes. have... That's high. It's not something we talk about because, um, you know, I, I don't think, I think it's wishful thinking. We don't want to recognize that it is a, a major issue. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily a health issue because if you look at an arrested white spot lesion, it's more resistant to acidic challenge than the surrounding tooth structure, but it's an aesthetic problem. You go through all this effort, you want a really nice aesthetic result. Um, you know, we have... Uh, the original study, you know, 1982, where they looked at it, uh, it was 50% of patients. 
We threw various interventions at it for about three decades, and we do a study that was out of Baylor most recently, actually two studies out of Baylor, you know, and uh, both of them have showed that the incidence has absolutely not changed from what we've seen uh, in the past. And the problem is, um, you know, not, you know, necessarily, um, you know, what you know products we're doing it's it's tree it's timing of uh, the interventions and it's how we're targeting uh, the interventions because we need to look more at sugar clearance uh, and the quality of the bacteria because the the braces themselves are going to increase retention of sugars for about you know another six to ten minutes over what they normally would be in the mouth and that's a lot of time when you consider what bacteria do in a matter of like 10 15 seconds with the sugars yeah, I was amazed, like, uh, you know, so many people, uh, they throw water fluoridation under a bridge because there's some yeah. white spot fluorosis. And I'm like, yeah. as opposed to what, chrome still crowns? I mean, uh, yeah. you know, and, and that that's yeah. their biggest concern about water fluoridation is a cosmetic uh, spot. Um, that is a, So you're in charge, you pioneered the development of soft tissue orthodontics curriculum for Henry Schein Orthodontics. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, what is your, what is a soft tissue orthodontics curriculum? So, um, you know, the, uh, the soft tissue curriculum is essentially, you know, it's a natural evolution of what we established, you know, uh, Dave Sarver, Bill Prof, and Jim Ackerman establishing what's called the soft tissue paradigm uh, in the late 90s. So what the soft tissue paradigm uh, is, was, you know, kind of a look back on the last, you know, 40, 30, 40 years of uh, orthodontic research and, uh, you know, seeing that the 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 biggest determinants of our treatment planning and our outcomes were not hard tissue factors it was not the bone it was not the teeth it was not um you know the jaw the the articular surfaces of the jaw it was the soft tissues it was the soft tissues within the joint it was the periodontal apparatus it was the airway it was the tongue it was the facial soft tissue contours and uh with that knowledge Part of what they laid out, uh, you know, with this new paradigm was the fact that not only do we need to change what we're looking at in diagnosis, but to also develop new tools to address these soft tissue elements. And when we look at, um, you know, essentially uh, the natural evolution of, uh, you know, what this paradigm enjoins us to do, it calls us to to look at things like Botox, to look at things like soft tissue fillers, and to be able to look at the face and look at the periodontal apparatus in uh, a new way, you know, more of an outside-in approach rather than an inside-out approach, focusing on just the hard tissues, and look at adaptation uh, of these tissues uh, and make determinations about how we can uh, use the adaptive potential uh, to get to uh, the goals that we have for the face, for the teeth, uh, you know, for the smile uh, in the most stable and uh, most, uh, you know, functional and aesthetically uh, pleasing fashion that we can. Um, so this course, and that's a very long winding way to describe it, uh, is, you know, basically looking at how we can uh, take this, uh, you know, diagnostic process and this paradigm apply it to our treatment mechanics, apply it to our treatment decisions, and then also how we can use the new tools like photobiomodulation, look at uh, you know, the, the injectables, and use all of that blended together to extend the envelope of treatment and the types of changes that we can provide for our patients uh, and do so in a systemized fashion that's going to be you know, predictable uh, in the hands of orthodontists. You know, to me, um, the consumer, when you talk about orthodontics, you know, Socrates said, you know, we had two emotions, greed and fear. The greed is, I want wider, brighter, sexier teeth. I want to look better. The fear <laughs> is money and two years. They just don't want two years. And we keep hearing about uh, technologies to accelerate ortho. I think you could probably get $10,000 for ortho if you could do it in one weekend. Um, where, where is the technology... Uh, for accelerating ortho that we hear about. What, what, do, what are your thoughts on this? You know, the appliances now that we use, um, you know, my target for normal treatment unaccelerated is 12 to 14 months uh, with, you know, the normal teenage patient. Um, you know, I'm done in about a year. You give me a compliant patient, that's my, my target for them. Um, I'm finishing many of them in less than a year and much of which, 
isn't even necessarily in braces. You know, we're looking at maybe eight months in braces and we're done with uh, treatment with really severely uh, crowded uh, cases with, you know, significant AP corrections. You know, and it's all about, uh, you know, developing efficient appliances that allow us to express our vision, uh, you know, uh, a little bit better than the, than the week before or the month before or the year before. So, you know, we're really evolving, you know, just the appliances and how precise they can actually be in treating patients. Uh, but when we add into that the ability to go ahead and enhance the actual underlying biology, that's really profound because now we can uh, get uh, much better outcomes. We can get there more stably. We can get there more comfortably. And then we can also get there in half the time or even sooner. So, you know, we have things like orthopulse uh, and photobiomodulation type uh, uh, appliances and, um, you know, modalities to uh, accelerate growth, accelerate uh, the movement of teeth. We have Excelident, we have, uh, you know, Propel, which is uh, microosseous uh, osseous perforations. Uh, we have Wilkodonics, which in my mind was probably the, uh, you know, it's PAOO, the periodontally uh, accelerated osteogenic orthodontics, same as Wilco. Um, you know, they were out in Erie, Pennsylvania, that, um, you know, brother uh, periodontist and orthodontist. Um, what really, was their name? What was their name? Uh, the uh, Wilco brothers. Yeah, Wilco brothers. Now that that was it, a surgery. Exactly. And we have all of the and that accelerated tooth movement, but what I think of it as is was was probably the first soft tissue orthodontic treatment because what you're doing is you're modifying the the gingival phenotype by adding bone um, uh, around these teeth, creating the corticotomies. And yeah, you know, maybe it doesn't end up being actual corticized, you know, uh, natural bone in the end, but it's a vascularized, uh, you know, alloplast that's there. Uh, and it's like, you know, the difference between, you know, real breast and fake breast. If I can see it, it's real, you know, it's vascularized and we've changed the phenotype and created a much healthier, um, you know, outcome for those patients. So, you know, that, um, you know, all of these modalities, you know, from something that's, you know, invasive like the Wilco to things that are non-invasive like the uh, Orthopulse, Excelident, all uh, do things to enhance the biology uh, to uh, increase the envelope of treatment that we have uh, accessible to us. And I think they're really great tools. And we're done, you know, with, you know, six to nine months in, uh, you know, most of these cases with patients and with aligners, with braces, you know, it's they love the fact that they're done sooner. And you only have a limited window of compliance anyway. I figure we'd, why not, why waste it on, um, you know, uh, slow treatment. So are the, you said the Wilco brothers are out by you in Pennsylvania? No, they're out in Erie, the Western PA. Yeah. But I mean, that you're still in, you, I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, so do, do they it's still. It's closer than Arizona, let's put it that way. Yeah. How, uh, <laughs> how, do those guys still do that? They do, yeah, they do. How, it, how uh, old are they now? I mean, I remember hearing about them decades ago you know i honestly don't know their uh, per, uh, exact ages but you know they've been doing it a long time and they've got some really great uh you know long-term data now or semi-long term in in the grand scheme of orthodontics so they've got you know their 10 and 15 year data now on this um and you well, know they're showing great stuff with it and uh you know the milo hellman award winner essentially was uh doing core decision and adding bone on both sides of the arch and they found that when you put down um the grafted bone there you actually uh have less dehiscence less fenestration in the bone you have a much healthier uh, gingival tissue there when you move these teeth into that area so you know it does wonderful things and when we need to add bone and change gingival phenotypes prior to treatment and where we're going in the direction of where we're going to advance uh, the dentition uh, it's a really wonderful tool well i'm sure they're going to be pleased to find out that i was shocked you're still alive and doing it <laughs> i imagine right. the, uh, i will not open up any packages mailed from them to my front door um you you yeah. you, you talked about excelident and orthopulse what, what's what's the difference between excelident and orthopulse you know and there's there's some dispute um you know in it's almost like, you know, when we look at, so the, the orthopulse is, uses uh, uh, basically infrared light. Uh, I believe theirs is like 855 nanometers, um, you know, and they, they're, you know, uh, they've been 
you know, kind of tinkering with some different design issues. So that may be, you know, not a current number. Um, but essentially, you're looking at, you know, uh, near infrared, uh, you know, spectrum of light, a treatment that penetrates into the bone and around the teeth uh, to go ahead and uh, activate activate the mitochondria. So that way, it basically tr- uh, charges up the cell batteries and it affects all the cells in a positive way. So inflammation. Bone deposition, angiogenesis, uh, rate of orthodontic tooth movement, all that improves with orthopulse. Uh, Accelident uses um, uh, pulsed, soft pulse vibrations, um, which is, you know, they use a uh, lower frequency. I think it's 40 hertz, uh, you know, and, and you know, I... 25 grams of force, essentially, give or take, um, to go ahead and stimulate uh, cells in a similar manner. Now, uh, there is some, you know, current dispute about uh, vibrational stimulus. The irony uh, here is, um, you know, when we look at the fact that, um, you know, people get really sensitive in orthodontics about claims about faster treatment because, um, you know, when, uh, you know, some orthodontic bracket companies came out and uh, were marketing direct to the public, orthodontists, you know, feel like they're, you know, in their ivory tower, they're the only people who can speak directly to the public. God forbid an orthodontic company or anyone else tells the public anything about orthodontic treatment. So they get offended by it. You know, and that, uh, you know, you're dealing with, you know, bracket companies <laughs> producing a product. Um, that they say is faster, but it's not FDA approved to be faster. It's only FDA approved to move teeth. When we look at a product like Accelident, it has FDA approval to be both safe, it's not going to electrocute anybody in their bathtub, and efficacious. So in order for them to make any claims about faster tooth movement, they need to have shown to the FDA that these claims are reasonable uh, and they're not overstating it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to market it. So, you know, we have, anytime something new comes out, there's uh, contingents within the profession, in the specialty, that their job, they feel, is to disprove things. And they're, you know, there's very smart people doing this and they're very good at it. You have to be very smart to be able to do this effectively in scientific studies. Um, and they'll go out and uh, basically produce some some fairly flawed, methodologically flawed studies that um, you know show uh, you know that that vibrations don't work. I could go through that line by line. You know that's a longer discussion. But the bottom line is this: they've shown, and the best, most well controlled study that they have is a study that used a five dollar electric toothbrush. It was a split mouth study. They waited 16 weeks, I believe, until the RAP effect, which can confound uh, the rate of orthodontic tooth movement, was completed, and they did segmental uh, retraction of a canine. One side of the mouth, they put uh, you know, the vibrations with the toothbrush. The other side of the mouth, they did not. And they measured not only the rate of tooth movement, but also the gingival cravicular fluid, and they looked at... Um, the cytokines that were being released. And what they found was on the side with vibrations, uh, they found that the rate of orthodontic tooth movement was much, much faster. I think it was twice as fast. And they also found really, really significant uh, upregulation of key cytokines related to tooth movement. Now, if that's not a validation that vibrational stimuli do something positively to orthodontic tooth movement, I don't know what metric people have out there to show that you know, this, uh, this is a, an actual treatment that actually does something to the biology. When we understand that, the question is not you know, um, you know, if it works, it's how we can get it to work better, how we can deliver vibrations to areas of the mouth better, what vibrations work better in people. And the studies have shown that not all skeletal types uh, respond the same way to the same frequencies. Not all, not all, uh, you know, PDL types respond the same way to the same frequencies. So I think there's a lot of questions to be answered, and it's relatively new, um, you know. And it may not, uh, you know, the accelerant appliance it may not be the best appliance for every single patient. There's a lot more, you know, literature now uh, on the orthopulse uh, device that's very, you know. Uh, encouraging, but we still need to explore these areas and figure out how we can utilize things that are modulating and impacting the biology uh, to the degree that we want. You know, if it's we're paying, you know, uh, you know, several hundred dollars, a thousand dollars for one of these devices to help patients out, we want it to work. 
We want it to do exactly what we're prescribing it to do. And I think when these companies come out with um, you know, insufficient um, you know, research behind it uh, and release the product, you know, some people have a bad experience and they you know, do not uh, you know, have uh, you know, the, you know, the experience that's going to say, hey, you know, this appliance is working uh, and working well for my patients. And then they just simply say that it does not work. So, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, to find out how we can use, you know, photobiomodulation, uh, you know, basically ultrasound, uh, uh, various other forms of vibrational stimuli to enhance bone deposition, enhance uh, stability of treatment, enhance the speed of orthodontic tooth movement. It's a really, really growing area, and we need to work a lot harder on developing the right type of research to uh, look into this. So where are you at? You know, uh, Invisalign uh, bought iTero a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, where, what percent of your practice is uh, polyvinyl siloxane and, and impressions um, what, with dental what? materials versus uh, um, oral uh, scan, digital scanning? How much are you old world dental let's, materials? Let's be, yes. Let's <laughs> are, are you all digital scanning nowadays? No, I, we're... Uh, I would say we're like 97, 98% digital. Um, we have a, uh, a, a 3D printer uh, in-house uh, that we use to uh, basically almost entirely eliminate alginate impressions. Uh, nobody who's going uh, into treatment, unless we absolutely need a retainer, a suck down retainer or need some sort of model within 30 minutes, because the, the printing technology is almost there, but it's not quite. Um, we don't need to do an algae impression, and we don't do that on patients. It's so far more. So basically, what active. you're saying is Billy yeah. Joel was not talking about steel mills in Bethlehem. He was talking about alginate factories, yeah, and PBS exactly. factories in Allentown, and you're the man who closed down those factories. Pretty much laid off uh, all those alginate workers. Yeah, no, and it's it's um, there's some really wonderful stuff uh, you know coming down the road in terms of leveraging these technologies um, you know and there's a lot of companies that are working to do that I'm now part of uh, the the digital advisory committee uh, at Henry Schein <clears throat> and we're working um, you know with the uh, the three shape uh, you know intraoral scanner and the their ortho analyzer software to uh, develop better workflows for orthodontics uh, and dentistry and there's some really, I can't talk too much about it, but there's some really great stuff that's, uh, that's coming down the road uh, in this area. And, you know, right now, I think that there's absolutely, um, you know, no reason, you know, to not own a scanner, to not own, uh, you know, even uh, a, you know, almost a hobbyist kind of uh, 3D printer. There's ones out there that are available for less than $2,000 uh, that will meet many orthodontic practices needs. Um, you know, it may be a little bit more um, intensive in terms of the learning curve uh, to utilize some of the low-end printers because it's not pre-made. There's no training and support and other things that you might get from a larger company. But there's definitely printers right now that people can pick up that is, you know, costing them, uh, you know, far less than what they would pay for the, these larger style printers. So that's how I'm going to retire a millionaire. I'm going to get a 3D yeah. printer. That just prints out 3D printers, and just to just have one 3D printer that just makes like ten a day. What do you think of that idea? You think I can find I it? I think it's perfect. Well, okay. So That's you good. said you said the what? You said you're 97 percent digital impressions and pretty much yeah. getting rid of your algae and all that. But but go back to the kids and tell them why though. Why why do you want why do you want oral digital scanning instead of just an old fashioned impression? You know, and here's the thing. I look at it in two fundamental ways. You know, people complain about commoditization of the specialty all the live long day. And if you look at commoditization and you look at innovation, those two notions are fundamentally opposed to one another. Um, you know, basically, if you want to go ahead and stay above the rising tide of commoditization, you need to invest in technology for your patients. And my philosophy uh, in why I'm investing in this technology is, is primarily from a customer service standpoint. I want to be able to go ahead and be, deli be delivering the most precise, the most accurate, the most comfortable uh, styles of treatment. Um, and that 
really rolls into why we've elected to get away from impressions in the first place. Uh, you know, we were the first orthodontist in our area to have, uh, you know, an intraoral scanner. Uh, we're the first to have a 3D printer, and we're going to continue to be, uh, you know, on top of things for our patients because that's what they deserve. And if we look at uh, the ability to, um, you know, essentially do things with this 3D technology in, uh, you know, various different ways, uh, it's things that we could not do uh, as effectively with alginate impressions. Um, you know, not only is it just nice for the patient, but now I can actually save them appointments during this process because when I'm, you know, uh, essentially transitioning out of braces uh, or Invisalign for these patients, um, the final adjustments are being done, the patient is scanned, those adjustments are incorporated into uh, the, um, you know, uh, the final retainers uh, after we scan using the software that we have, so we no longer have to have them back for an impression appointment simply just to get them that impression or to do the impression and have a longer uh, removal appointment. We have them back, and by those times those adjustments have expressed, they're going to fit perfectly with the retainer that we have pre-designed for them, um, so it saves an appointment there. Uh, we're also able to you know, transition seamlessly in and out uh, of Invisalign, uh, maintaining the attachments on the teeth as opposed to removing them, doing the PVS impression, uh, and doing a refinement uh, series of aligners, uh, which would degrade our force systems. Uh, if there's a carrier motion appliance on, uh, I have that digitally removed. I have lots of appliances that are in the patient's mouth removed digitally instead of physically uh, after we do the scan. Again, that's a convenience factor for the patient. Uh, and then there's lots of other things that we can uh, have uh, rapidly produced for these patients You know, when it comes to uh, you know, occlusal, occlusal splints. Um, to digitally storing these retainers and getting them to patients quicker. I can't tell you how many college students lose their retainers and then aren't able to come in for an appointment. So by the time they get around to coming back on their you know, college break, well, the teeth have already moved, they've already shifted. If I have a digital representation of their final bite, their final smile that I can use to produce and send them a retainer, that is an important investment uh, on behalf of protecting the results for our patients. Uh, and it's certainly something that I wanted to do. So, you know, there's a lot of advantages just beyond the customer service factor. But, you know, even if it was just customer service, I certainly would do it because I want to provide, you know, that for our patients. Um, you know, um, when I got out of school, the, the panel was the big thing. Yeah. And now it's a CBCT. Um, where is the standard of care? I mean, is most ortho... Oh, there. Still just two-dimensional panoceft, or is it really time to go 3D cone beam? It's, it's absolutely time to go 3D cone beam. The biggest barrier is simply finances. Um, but why? You know, why, 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 not, why do you need 3D instead of 2D for ortho? Well, the, when we looked at, um, you know, essentially before, and we look at dosimetry, and we look at comparative dose, we need to go ahead and go with the uh, you know, lowest reasonable dose for our patients. Now, if we have three-dimensional technology with the radiographs, there's several things that we can now uh, do and will now be able to do moving forward. First and foremost, um, if we're doing anything with the airway, doing anything uh, with impacted teeth, you know, and certainly with the airway, you know, uh, looking and seeing a, a small MCA, which is that minimal cross-sectional area, Seeing that and saying, oh, this patient has a sleep problem, that's not enough. You need a sleep study to verify the fact that they have a sleep disorder. The, uh, the MCA data just simply is a substitute for endoscopy and allows us to go ahead and titrate and look at where the problem might be uh, and help inform our decisions. Now, if we're looking at the airway uh, and the shape of the airway, if we're looking at impacted teeth, if we're looking at uh, transverse problems and vertical problems, we're looking at TMJ uh, problems, uh, and just generally getting information that was not available in a two-dimensional uh, radiograph, all of that improves the standard of care for our patients. And now that the symmetry has come way, way down uh, to the point where it's essentially less than a pan and a ceph for a five-second quick scan uh, with, the, uh, with the ICAT FLX, why, why not have that for all of our patients? Well, the reason being is cost. You know, not everybody can just go out and pull the trigger uh, on uh, an ICAT FLX. 
Um, you know, we, we have one, you know, we have an instrumentarium, which is very good. I believe An Anatomage has the absolute best software uh, out there, and that's why we've elected to go uh, with both of those machines, um, because it's the Anatomage software that's driving um, the, uh, the three-dimensional, um, you know, rendering and all that. Um, but, you know, when we look at what the standard of care is for our patients, um, I think, you know, working in 3D allows us to do such a, you know, more, uh, you know, precise job for our patients to, uh, to provide the level of care that I want, you know, that three-dimensional information is essential. And with it, you know, we don't necessarily, we won't in the future have to do any progress scans uh, with, uh, with the, the radiographs unless we're looking for root resorption. And we can do a small field of view for that. You know, we simply need to just take our, uh, you know, merge data with our intraoral scanner and we're going to be able to track the root movements along with treatment and the roots that we have from that three-dimensional radiograph are just going to walk along right with that uh, intraoral scanning uh, technology that we have and the two of those blended together and those are going to be essential moving forward the price points are only going to come down uh, for these machines the dosimetry is only going to come down for these machines and I cannot uh, you know, once you have that technology and you understand how impactful it is for your patient care, it's really difficult to walk backwards and say that I can accept, you know, lower quality of information and a lower quality of care. Uh, I believe it's essential now that, uh, you know, you know, since we've integrated it for our patients long ago. So what, what percent of dentists do you, th of orthodontists, um, are really treating sleep apnea and that's a major part of their practice. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's, um, you know, I don't know what that percentage exactly would be. You know, from my point, I think everyone should be doing it. I think everyone should be looking at it. Now, are we, are we going to be doing oral appliances? You know, no, that's not particularly the style of practice that I want to do. But uh, early interventional, uh, you know, treatment of the airway in terms of uh, doing, um, you know, things to uh, have the tonsils and adenoids appropriately addressed, to titrate the position of the mandible, uh, to uh, provide adequate room for the tongue, uh, to develop the nasomaxillary complex uh, with our appliances is, um, you know, things that we can do very effectively and permanently for our orthodontic patients that improve the airway. Now, doing an oral appliance in an adult, it's really, you know, kind of a temporary solution for something that needs to be addressed uh, orthognathically with the surgery. Um, you know, essentially, and uh, having, you know, people, you know, uh, dentists who in our area, in Allentown, um, you know, who've done uh, oral appliance therapy uh, for, um, you know, sleep apnea patients for a long time, you know, Barry Glassman, you know, we used to work together, um, you know, on a lot of cases, um, you know, he was a big believer in phase two, uh, orthodontics. So after, uh, he was finished, uh, removing their pain, removing their sleep apnea, they would get kicked over to us to go ahead, uh, and align the teeth and provide uh, the result, uh, you know, permanently for that patient. Those appliances will change the bite. You know, it's just a matter of how long it takes to do so, even with just nighttime wear. We can kind of uh, slow that down by doing, you know, tooth positioners in the morning and other, you know, techniques. But ultimately, those forces over time are going to change the bite. And we need to make sure that we provide as permanent of an option uh, as we can for patients. So in my world, because I'm able to move the teeth and the jaws, either surgically or non-surgically, that's what I want to be doing. And uh, we can do that much more readily in younger patients. Uh, in the adults, it's going to frequently require some form of surgical procedure. Uh, but I want to provide the uh, permanent solution. So I'm looking at the airway all the time because it's going to impact stability. It's going to impact their overall health. Uh, and you know, it needs to be a part of my treatment considerations. I can't believe we've already gotten four minutes over an hour. That, I think that was uh, the go. absolute fastest hour I've ever done. I, uh, I think I'm going over all my notes. I think I asked all my questions. Uh, Scott, seriously, you're an amazing man. Uh, my, my only last question is a personal question. How could you go from San Francisco to Allentown. I mean, San Fran, that's got to be the coolest city in America. Was that a culture shock going to Allentown? Well, I'm, I'm originally from Allentown. The burritos I miss. I really miss the burritos out there. The burritos? Seriously. It's, you know, we don't have the same caliber of, uh, 
you know, uh, Mexican food here uh, in Allentown. But I'll tell you what, um, you know, I'm as an alumnus uh, at UOP, I'm always looking for good reasons to go back and get a burrito there, uh, and there's certainly a lot of them. So, uh, and what was know. that? What's that restaurant? Was it the the garlic the garlic rose? The stinking oh, rose. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The stinking the stinking rose. I think it is. It's the only restaurant in the world. It uses forty thousand pounds of garlic a oh, year. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh my God, I love San Francisco. Yeah, the garlic that's... fries at the Giants games; those are good. Oh my goodness, there's. But, but uh, I want one there's... thing to these kids because pro- probably twenty percent of this audience could be in dental school, from what we think. Um, with San Francisco having two dental schools and being so crowded, uh, do you think there was more economic opportunity for you leaving San Francisco and going to Allentown? I mean, do you think you could do what you were do that you're what you're doing now? Everything you're doing, all that in downtown San Francisco, you know. Or do you think I, demographics matter? I think, you know, I, I believe you know enough in uh, in my abilities to be able to um, you know to go and uh, you know do things in downtown San Francisco. Uh, I had been helping out with you know branding and marketing with my father's practice long before I got uh, you know bought in here, uh, but. You know, so I, I was already kind of, you know, invested and committed to coming back to Allentown. Um, so I never really, you know, kind of looked at opportunities and areas there. You know, it's all about hustle. It's all about work. If you're willing to put in the work and you got the skills to pay the bills, you're going to do well wherever you're at. Um, you know, and, you know, not not everybody can, you know, you know, it's not everybody's going to, you know, go out there. I wish I could say that we would have a hundred percent success rate of, you know, people graduating. Certainly the student loan debt is, um, you know, a problem, uh, you know, for a lot of people and it puts the squeeze, um, on young doctors, uh, young orthodontists, young dentists. Um, you know, my advice to them is utilize the income driven repayment system, uh, invest, uh, in your practice, invest in your savings and your retirement early on, because that's when it matters the most. Um, we're, you know, what uh, what's going to happen with student debt? I believe there's, you know, some political, you know, issues that, you know, maybe they could resolve on the on the forums on Dentaltown um, about what's even going to happen with some of the student debt. Uh, and until, uh, you know, we really have more certainty in this area, I think, um, you know, making sure that you have a really good financial foundation uh, and not aggressively, you know, overpaying into the debt too soon is going to be important for um, new graduates because. You know, it's, you know, if you have the, you know, no debt and, you know, uh, you know, the only way that gets paid down is a healthy practice. Um, and you really need to focus on that, uh, initially. Well, Scott, you, uh, my, um, the orthodontist from Orthotown, uh, wanted me to, uh, podcast interview you and, uh, you were amazing. Uh, thank you so much for spending an hour with me and all my homies today. I know they learned, uh, so much, probably more than they uh, imagine. So thank you so much for your time today, and uh, th- this was awesome. Well, thank you. You know, and uh, I'm always open, you know, for questions, you know, if I can get to them. You know, if people want to shoot me an email or go to the website. And, well, uh, which website? Because you have, you have Fry Smiles spelled F-R-E-Y you know, honest, smiles so, dot com. So by the, the ortho- time this is released, you might yeah. have the website theorthocosmos.com. Yeah, the orthocosmos um, is probably going to be you know within the next week or two. It's going to be be up. You know, it's early September right now. Um, but uh, you know, if they go to either site, um, you know, I'll find a way to get back to them. But uh, you know, I uh, I try to be as responsive as I can what, be. What's your email? Uh, my email is d r s c o t t at frysmiles dot com. So Dr. Scott at frysmiles dot com. Yeah. And it's not mm-hmm. a French fry. It's a f r e y. Yeah, f r e y s m i l e s. And yeah. your dad's an orthodontist too. He is. Um, yeah, he's uh, you know been in practice almost forty years. So do you think it was a genetic gene that he passed on, or was that gene I guess, recessive I or think, dominant? Yeah, when I was at Wash U. Um, I was looking at, you know, going into to medicine. Um, heck, I'd been tracing stuff since I was like ten years old, so I had, you know, pretty good knowledge of uh, of what, um, you know, the orthodontic office looked like. And it just seemed like every, you know, medical doctor <clears throat> and physician that I talked to, you know, was uh, dealing with some sort of existential crisis about their profession. And my father seemed pretty happy uh, coming home every day, 
Um, so, you know, I felt uh, going into the dental field uh, was something that would allow me to do something in healthcare and give back uh, to people and also enjoy the work that I do and not have to deal with, you know, bureaucracy and other things that, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, other areas of healthcare struggle with more than, uh, than dentistry. But, you know, it's kind of funny because the Fortune 500 gets 99% of the press. <laughs> But when you go around the planet and look at the 7 billion people, family mm -hmm. businesses are still a third of the economy. I, I don't care if you're talking about a goat farmer in Tanzania, yeah. a cattle farmer in Texas, a wheat farmer. I mean, mm -hmm. my friends, a third of them were on family yeah. farms that went back two, 300 years. Well, that's the funny thing. You know, heck, you know, if, you, if you get an MBA, they have an entire, you know, course track on family owned businesses because – you know, they're as opposed to, you know, non family run ones, uh, they have a much longer view of things and they, they, well. they survive, uh, you know, a lot longer than some other businesses because, you know, they're not making decisions for short term gains. It's long term benefit all the time. And, you know, many companies out there, that's, you know, really all they're looking to do is they're looking for that short term, um, you know, number for profitability that quarter. And there's, there's, you can always take, you know, growth and squeeze more profit out of it, you know, uh, you know, by cutting costs very easily, but making the appropriate investments for long-term health is, is not something, uh, you know, that's overlooked in the family business, uh, very often. So, you know, yeah, that's, I think, I think publicly traded companies, all they worry about is milking the cow and family owned yep. business actually like to feed the cow. But, uh, yeah. again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all that you and your father have done for orthodontics. Well, thank you.